In a world of chaos, confusion, and uncertainty, only one man can provide the clarity that we need to become our personal and professional best. That man is Pat Riot. Were you expecting someone else? How are you doing? I'm doing great, best, and I'm working to get even better. What a beautiful day here in Washington we're having. Just talking to plain old folks from America and asking them simple questions like, what's best about America? That guy right there, he's the best. Personal professional best. Be your best. How are you, ma'am? People kind of like me, they do. But what's the best part of America? Being able to walk freely as you're right here. You can see a thousand of people walking around. Hello, she likes me. She's just shy. (laughs) What's the best part of America? Other than the, what is that, ice cream? Yeah, the frozen lemonade. Other than that, what's the best part of America? I think that uh, it's so multicultural. Multicultural. Mm-hmm. The people. The people. Uh, yeah. I like the people. Very friendly people. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Very open, very friendly. All I right. Like well, you keep working on yeah. becoming your best, right? Yes. <laughs> In your relationship yes. and then professionally, okay? Okay. Good See luck you. Great spending time with you today. Yeah, okay. All right? Bye. See y'all. Well, let's talk about America. What's best about America? What's best about America? Um, what's the greatest country in the world? And everybody Ooh. has freedom. See those flags, it gives us all an opportunity to become our personal and professional best. And we need to make sure we take full advantage of the opportunity that we have. Welcome to our program. Pat Riot reporting from Washington, D.C. What's the best part of America? Not the best place, but the best thing about America. The food! The food! Yeah, burgers! Burgers! People are finding themselves very comfortable telling us that it is the best in America. Is it perfect? No. Just like you, just like me, we've got imperfections. So does the country, so do the companies that we work for. But you know what? We should all wake every day with gratitude because we live in the best country. That's a fact. As we begin the second half of 2019 and with our collective interest in the housing market, I thought it would be a good idea to welcome back one of our favorite guests to Personal Professional Best, and that is one of the most informed voices uh, regarding U.S. housing and everything housing related in the United States. And that is Doug Duncan, the Chief Economist with Fannie Mae. Doug, welcome back. Thanks. uh, Glad to be invited. So. We had you on our um, program last September, and we had you on the program in March, and you made the comments to us at the time about what your thoughts were forecasting-wise going forward. And I know you focus an awful lot here at Fannie on forecasting, and we're glad you do because it helps all of us plan our business. So we haven't heard from you in March. A number of things have happened since with the economy as an overall and specific to housing. What's your forecast for the second half of 2019? I think it's going to be pretty stable uh, from where it is today. Uh, that uh, Let me look first at interest rates. The uh, Fed uh, has prepared the market for a rate cut in uh, July. Uh, interest rates are already expecting that, so I don't expect a lot of movement in rates as a result of that because it's pretty much baked in. Uh, that's rates at a lot lower level than was anticipated certainly a year ago or even six months ago. Uh, And so we expect some pickup in refi that we would not have expected uh, in the first half of the year uh, with that come down in rates. How much of a pickup we get in sales is an open question. We don't think 
uh, that we're going to get back to the same level of total sales as we had in 2018, but there'll be some pickup from the first half into the second half. So it'll be more backloaded. It will year. be more backloaded. Yeah, it seemed like last year we hit mid-year and rates were on the increase. This is yeah. in 2018, and when we got to the fourth quarter last year, we pretty much hit the high on interest rates, just over 5%, and we felt the trend slowing in housing. And of course, we've had a reversal where rates started moving down in the beginning of 19, but we were a little slow and we felt a pickup. So expectations are a little bit better second half this year. They are. And there's a, there's a little difference in the response of the market to those who already own a home and have a mortgage. They tend to be earlier recognizers of the opportunity for a refinance. For people who are in the buy space that they're thinking about buying a house, that's a longer recognition factor because they're actually simultaneously looking for a house and looking for a mortgage. So there's a little bit of a timing difference. between. Yeah, that's a great point because those that were getting mortgages in the last couple of years were getting them in the high threes with interest rates and fours. And when we got up last year where rates are about five, the idea of trading to a new house and giving up the cost of money at historic lows, not such a good idea, but we're now back to those historic lows again. So that's um, right. it sets up pretty well. Earlier this month, um, Everybody was anticipating the unemployment number coming out, and the trend of employment last month in May was down some. This month's surprise to the upside. Good news, because we do need people to actually have jobs in this era to be able to buy homes. 224,000 jobs added in combination with a 3.7 unemployment rate now and a 3.7 interest rate now. Did you ever imagine in your career, in your lifetime, that you'd see 3.7 unemployment and 3.7 30-year fixed rates? <laughs> I remember sitting in my office at the Mortgage Bankers Association, June of 2003, which was the 10-year the uh, treasury rate hit 3.11. And I looked at that on the, the, on the uh, television screen and I said, uh, will I ever see a number like that again? <laughs> And the answer uh, is obviously uh, looking after the fact, that yes, uh, much lower than that. For rates to go lower than the, where they are today, mind you, in 2016, the Treasury hit 1.6. That was the bottom for the post-crisis period. Uh, and there's still a lot of people who are locked in at rates that they took during that time frame. Still at 2%, yep. getting pretty close to that. If the global economy takes a significant downturn, whether it's resulting from trade or other other factors within other major economies, that would be the direction that we would go. The U.S. is pretty resilient relative to the rest of the globe, but we're not completely isolated from it, as you can tell from the trade discussions sure. that are underway. So if, <clears throat> if rates and in combination employment, the strength of employment, which at this point, career-wise, myself and you, we've not seen anything. Yeah. This like is 50 this. year lows. These are 50 year lows on both, rates. which are obviously advantages for housing. What are the objections for housing doing even better than it is right now? Well, the, the biggest problem is supply. The, the, in those unemployment numbers and the high level of employment that we have, the best news in that is that wage rates for lower income households are finally coming up. That's where entry level buyers often come from, is those folks who are starting out a career or are in, uh, in uh, categories of jobs which have seen lagging wage growth. So that, that's combined with this low unemployment rate. But people have to have houses to buy. And uh, the boomers are doing what they said they were gonna do, which is aging in place. The Gen Xers, which isn't freeing up uh, uh, for that's first time home buyers, yeah. that supply. The Gen Xers, who the group that took the biggest damage in the crisis, are also looking and saying, well, you know what? In this house, I managed to survive. I have this piece of land. That's the most expensive part of a house. Why don't I just tear the roof off and put on another layer? They're doing that, so they're not freeing up, move up, moving up, uh, move up homes. That leaves it on the hands, into the hands of the builders to increase supply through new construction. And they just, it's hard for them to build entry-level homes. They tend to have built in the past to the move-up buyers. So if people aren't moving up, it creates a supply, a supply problem for entry-level folks. And if you look at prices across the country, the low price segment is the fastest appreciating in price in every market, which tells you that's where the supply problem is. Yeah, so in some ways, <clears throat> when I think about it, I almost like the market where it is, where it, housing is good, it's not great. But with the, the attributes of unemployment and interest rates, 
Um, uh, if, if we did have the supply, we'd be going so fast that at some point, ultimately, then you face the other side of that, the slowdown. So mm -hmm. a stable market, arguably for all of us, even with some of the challenges, is, is um, better. Earlier this month, um, the Fed uh, uh, chairman uh, came out and talked about what's next for interest rates. Everybody was anticipating that. And of course, dovish. Um, I asked earlier before we got on this morning, um, does he really have a choice at this point? Because both, you know, the president in some ways is influencing or bearing influence that's not typical. And then also you have uh, the other side of it, which is the market's already pretty much moved, anticipating. Um, what are your thoughts on the Fed right now and what their next move is, if you will? Well, we've in our forecast, we have uh, for the remainder of this year, we have the Fed cutting a quarter point in uh, July really as an insurance policy, and we would expect them to, after they make that move, to then go into messaging, uh, suggesting that it was an insurance, that they're ready with additional insurance should it be merited, but we don't expect them to make another move until December, and then we do expect another quarter point cut in December. Part of that is we've been a little surprised that the market hasn't appreciated the slowdown in the way that it's been built into our forecast, for example. This is not new. We're, this is, if you look at our forecast from 18 months ago, you'll see pretty much the same profile as we've got in the forecast now. So it was our expectation that the economy would be slowing, and we thought others shared that expectation. Obviously, the markets didn't. Uh, the market is, is to some degree self-interested. Uh, we're at very high levels of uh, equity valuations, and certainly the Fed is going to attempt to message after the July movement about whether or not that's a factor in their thinking, or if it's m more so global uncertainties related to trade and the level of growth in other economies like China uh, and Europe, for example. Perfect. That was my next question. So, of course, there's lots of information in the news. Um, we talked earlier about that as well, just all the different inputs that you use in your forecasting. Uh, one of the things that's out there now that conversationally is probably occupying a lot of at least um, folks like yourself is the U.S.-China trade conversation. So to the extent that that's out there and uh, seemingly is going to either get better where we get a trade agreement or not so much, we continue the current dialogue. What are your thoughts about how that affects the overall economy and then specifically housing? Well, the U.S. is the least sensitive to trade issues of any of the major economies. In other words, the share of our national income, which comes from trade, is smaller than it is for other countries. That gives us an advantage if we're having a negotiation over trade. It is a lever that you can that you can play, but it's not a costless lever because ultimately it's consumers that pay the, pay the price. Let me just make one comment about free trade. What we what we have not had historically in my lifetime, or even before my lifetime, is free trade, where there are no restrictions on who can trade what with who. What we've had is managed trade, and that process of managed trade has gotten to more free trade than previously over the last 50 years. I think what we've reached is the peak of freer managed trade, and that's what's under discussion today. The relationship with China is more than just about trade, though. It's about global shipping lanes, international security, about intellectual property rights. It's a, actually much more complex than whether or not they're buying our soybeans or we're requiring tariffs on imported goods from China. So th there's a little bit of a misimpression in the press about exactly what's going on with China. That's going to be a long-term thing. I would say 20 or 30 years we'll be having this discussion. It's not just this administration. Got it. So on the margin, maybe it's not as economically impactful as we hear in the press. That is our conversations with China. But if we did get an agreement that felt like people were participating, collaborating, um, that would be beneficial. It would reduce uncertainties. So the, the Fed had commented on that appropriately, that one of the things that's holding back business investment is the uncertainty in the investment climate for companies that have international relationships. So 
an agreement would reduce that level of uncertainty and probably increase investment in the U.S. economy. So give us one or two things that we should look for that, if took place, would benefit housing, the economy, and housing at this point. And maybe one or two things that, if they took place, would negatively impact. As we think about planning our businesses, it's always good for us to put those inputs in sure. so we can be aware and, and watching what folks like yourself who are experts on the marketplace tell us that we should be looking for. So one well, or two I think, things. I, I think what we just talked about trade, it's not just trade with China, but also the discussion of tariffs on autos with Europe, that goes right to the heart of Germany, which is the engine in, in Europe. Europe. And Mexico, frankly, is our biggest trading partner, and they're our neighbor to the south. So trade relationships with them is very important to us. So not just China. Uh, a, uh, a second uh, thing to think about is um, really in the housing space, uh, is there anything that can be done to improve supply? Uh, because that's going to be the linchpin, particularly for the for the first-time buyers, and it is first-time buyers that are driving the market at the margin today. So um, within the within the mortgage space of that, which is where both of us reside, uh, the, you have two or three things going on. One is the issuance of a single security that is now mortgage-backed securities backed by both Fannie and Freddie. Uh, in guaranteed loans. That's an experiment that got launched at the beginning of June. It seems to be going well. It has the potential to unsettle markets if it doesn't go well. There's not a reason to think that it won't, but that's a pretty important structural change that's taking place in the mortgage industry. There's also a discussion of the privatization, uh, the potential privatization of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I think that, uh, while people are paying attention to that, I think that's a longer term consideration. The administration would like to see that. I think taxpayers would benefit from more clarity and uh, moving us into the private sector and clarity on the government's role in housing. I think that would be a, a healthy thing. There'll be discussions on that ongoing. Probably not something to get upset about, but uh, just to monitor because it's core to our business. And then finally, what the Fed uh, decides to do, because uh, housing, as we saw with the rate rise in 2018, is sensitive, perhaps more sensitive because it's so involved with first-time buyers than it has been in the past. And the profile uh, with which Fed sets rates uh, will have a lot to do with, uh, with where our industry goes. So I know you said last time you like to be accountable to your forecast, and you're right on schedule so, so far this year. Still 1% to 2% year over year, or is it about flat year over year from 18 to 19 number of home sales? Our uh, forecast right now is about 1% up this year. I, there's a chance we won't make that. Got it. Uh, and if... It, a lot of it depends on what happens with rates, uh, th because there was a bigger response to the rate rise in 18 than what we had ha expected, and there has been less response to the decline in rates than what we had expected. Interesting. Interesting. Last question I always want to ask you is this, because my business and those that are watching today in the real estate industry, whether you're representing sellers or buyers, in large part what we do is consult, we give advice, and oftentimes we get asked the question, is it a good time to sell? Is it a good time to buy? And I always love asking you this question because I think about that in terms of the consulting that we would give and how we would give it because we don't want to be perceived as selling anything to anyone. We want to be in a position if people want to sell and buy that we're giving them the very best advice. So if it was somebody really important in your life, your kids or your, or your uh, best friend that called you and said, Doug, is it a good time to sell? Is it a good time to buy? What do you tell us? Yeah, there's, uh, there's two things, one of which I didn't talk to you about before because we just released a study on this. We did a study at the end of 2018 to compare it to a study we did in 2015 about the understanding of what it takes to qualify for a mortgage. There's been no improvement in that. People still, still don't understand. understand the credit score. We know they that. They don't understand down payments, all that. So that's, a, that's one thing that your folks will have to coach sure. uh, folks through. But the principles about financial management don't change. If you have a family budget, which you should, then a budget. have a budget at today's interest rates and the house that you're looking at does it fit the family budget to make the mortgage payment that would be required to acquire that house? And if it does, 
then make the move today. Because if rates fall, you can refinance. You have the option to refinance on that and get a better, uh, better mortgage in the future. But if you don't, if you're betting on where interest rates are going, now you've moved from financial planning to speculation. to speculation. Can you afford to be a speculator? Bad idea, right. Take the Most emotions households. out. If the budget works and you can afford it, then it's a good time to buy. That's exactly right. Doug, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to give the real estate community the insights that you do. And uh, we appreciate the forecasting you give us because it helps us as we think about planning our business. So thanks for being a part of Personal Professional Best. Thank you. My pleasure. It's you again. Hi. And it's me. And we're both focused on becoming our personal and professional best. I'm so excited to be here in D.C. I am. First time as an adult that Pat Riot has been in D.C. Hey, little Sam, how you doing? Hey, you guys, how you doing? Very good, very good. Nice to meet you. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Nice to meet you, too. Hey, so where are you from? From uh, Vietnam. From Vietnam. Yeah. And you're here visiting America. Visiting. What's best about America? I mean, everything, man. everything. I just love America. You do? Yeah. Me too. I love America too. What about you? You love America? Yes. Yes? And you? All right, Mama Kel. Okay, so from Atlanta, right? Great state of Georgia. Why don't you tell the camera what do you think is best about America? Wow, that is a loaded question. <laughs> well, me being a former soldier, I Thank just you, love brother. it. <laughs> it's no problem. Thank uh, you. Just the thought where I've been and seen, no place in the world like I love like it. Like United States. Hey, what's the best part of America? Me. You? Yeah, you rock, hey, dude. Yeah. What do you think? I think the people. The people. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. All right, God bless you guys. All right. I like it. What's up? What's up? What's up? How you doing? Hey, what's happening? <laughs> like what makes America best? Faith in God. Faith in God. Amen. Amen. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Doug Duncan gave us a great update on the housing marketplace. We've had a great time. The best time today talking to people here in D.C. about what's best about America. I got to go now because I'm on my way to interview Senator Johnny Isaacson. I am personally honored today to welcome U.S. Senator Johnny Isaacson from my home state of Georgia to our Personal Professional Best program. Senator Isaacson, thanks for taking the time to give us a few of your, um, your thoughts today. It's good to be with you, Pat. Thank yeah. you. Um, I have several questions for you, but before I get started, I just wanted to share with the audience that, of course, you know that our entire program is about becoming our personal and professional best, about becoming the best version of ourselves. And when I was a young guy growing up in Georgia building a business, uh, there was a fellow named Johnny Isaacson who was in the real estate industry, built a great business in the real estate business. And he was someone that I had as a role model. And I remember thinking at the time that if I could actually grow to be a leader like Johnny, a guy who could bear influence, the things that I remember most about you is that you always operated, communicated so elegantly, but character, um, integrity, and grace, I always um, experienced. And I've tried to, and I just want you to know, a number of years later, I've tried to reflect all of those things in the businesses that I've run. So I just want to tell you thank you before we get started here. A lot of people did it, helped me that way, and I'm happy to help anybody I can that way, because that's the right, right way to live your right life. Well, you've done an amazing job bearing influence, Johnny, and I thank you for that. Um, so most people know you as a U.S. Senator. Um, once upon a time, myself and a lot of others uh, knew you as a real estate owner in the state of Georgia, the great state of Georgia, where you for a number of years had a, a very large and very successful real estate company. When you were running, building that company, running that company, we have a lot of realtors in the audience today. What were the most important factors that you focused on yourself and the folks that work for you in terms of gaining your success? Well, first of all, I observed the credit. I, I observed some of it, not, about, not all of it. I didn't start the company. My father didn't start the company, but he worked for it at the beginning. A, a home builder owned the company. It was a very small real estate brokerage company that my father managed 
when I got out of college uh, and after I got back in the service, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I fell in love with a lady named Diane. I figured if I didn't get out and sell something and make any money, I wasn't going to get married. So I got, went into real estate, started selling, and for a year I was an absolute failure. And I realized that if I didn't make some money, I was going to be in trouble and Diane might not marry me. So I got out and worked hard. I knocked on doors. I learned how to overcome objections. I tried to learn what, how to sell benefits rather than stuff like that. And I learned how to solve people's problems. And all of a sudden, I started making sales, not because I was a great salesman, but because I was a problem solver. And I wanted somebody to tell me what I could help them with. So that, the first thing I tell everybody is, if people know you want to help them and you try to do it, that's 90% of the battle. Then together, you can solve the problem. So I, I was very fortunate in uh, 35 years at Northside to be part of a great business. And I did run it for 25 years. And I enjoyed meeting great new people like you that have helped me in my political career as well as my business career. And we're back here today. Who would have thought, Pat, 20 years ago, if somebody said, Pat, do you think you'll be in the United States Capitol in what's, what's known as a hideaway? But this is a hideaway, one of our secret rooms. Talking to a United States senator on a Thursday afternoon, he'd say, oh, that's not going to ever happen. That's exactly right. I never expected that to happen. But... You're not the only person it's ever happened to. <laughs> but our job, but that's the way life is. If you open the door for opportunities that you want to make happen, the more doors you knock on, the better you'll be. And that's the same in real estate. The more doors you knock on, the better you'll be. So. It's great advice. And all of you, a lot of things have changed in the world, but there's some things that transcend time that never change. And the one thing I remembered about Johnny and Northside and the entire company is um, they always did the right thing by all of the people that they were involved with every day. And, and um, sometimes the simple things are actually the most important things to do well in life. So you have decades of experience, not only personally running a real estate company, but really following the overall economy. Did you ever imagine you'd live to see a day where we have 3.7% unemployment and 3.7% 30-year fixed rates? I didn't. In fact, it's interesting that we didn't practice this, by the way. Whoever's watching this, if they ever do, it's going to be a good show, I promise you. But if, if, if you do, we didn't practice this. And it's amazing what he's asked about. I think the most important thing we ought to talk about. I was asked yesterday in Washington, because the president made a statement about getting the, extending the national debt, and what we're we going to do about the run out of money and all this. And we talked about every, doing everything but the things we really ought to do, which is save more money, spend less money, and do the things normal people do. But the government always thinks about how you can borrow more money. But one of the things that we've got to do in Washington is live like the American people have to live. We have to make ends meet. We have to be proud of what we do, but work hard. We've got to make enough money to pay the bills. We ain't not borrow too much money. If we do that and run our government like we'd run our households, we're going to be in pretty good shape. And so that's what I'm spending a lot of time on right now, because we got a debt problem and a deficit problem, which eventually will be the one thing that can take us down as a country. I don't think America could be taken down now militarily or in any other way. Economically, our trade's too strong. Our businesses to develop things like that. But if we get into a bad debt problem, then we'll end up borrowing. When we start borrowing our operating expenses, we're in trouble. And let me give you the bad news. This month and this year, the United States of America will be, we're, today we, we have $22 trillion in debt and $19.5 trillion in assets. We are underwater. We are, our net worth is less than a dollar. And because of that, if it goes much further, or because of that when it goes further, T bills are going to go up. Ten year T bills, which have historically been at rates you can't believe, two and three and four percent, are going to go back to 10 or 15 like they used to be. And that means the debt pay you're paying on this money we've been borrowing is going to go up three or four, the cost of it is going to three or four times. And it's just going to feed in itself. So you hit the nail on the head. So yesterday we were here and we spent some time out on the street just talking to um, not only Americans that are visiting during the summer, but we talked to people from. Israel, we talked to people from Pakistan, from India, from Indonesia, we talked to people from Vietnam, and we asked them this question, so I want to ask you, what's the best part of America? Not geographically, but what's best, what makes America its best? The American people. Uh, when you boil it all down, our company's slogan used to be that our people make the difference. In America, our, our, for our country, our people make the difference. And uh, those are Americans that landed on the moon 1969, when we, John Kennedy said we're going to take a Go man to the moon and land him and bring him back home safely. Everybody said, well, that's great. That sounds great. How are we going to do that? And he did it. And they did it. And those were Americans that did it. I, I did the celebration on Paris, France, and, and uh, Normandy last two weeks ago for representing the American people with Nancy Pelosi at the, at the celebration of D-Day. 
And I shook hands with a 96-year-old man who 75 years before that day, when I had dropped into St. Mary Glees, the little village behind Normandy, Normandy Beach, and shot out of the sky by Germans on the ground, shooting at him his parachute as he came down. But he, he jumped out into the night to save lives, save our country, and save democracy and freedom, and he did it. And thousands more came after him, and of course, after that came the Battle of Bulls, and after the Battle of Bulls came a few others, but we, we defeated Hitler. We defeated more than that. We defeated this idea that there's something better than America. There's not. And when the chips were down, the Russians, you know, they were a problem, helped us. Everybody helped us. We won, won the war. We rebuilt everybody we bombed and loaned them all money so they could rebuild themselves. And, and, and we had a great country. Very few times you find in history the great things that America did post World War II. Done any time, but we did it. We didn't go ask to take the country. So we, as George Bush said it before the UN when he made his speech about going into Iraq, he said, Remember this about America. We will send our sons and daughters into battle to fight for freedom every day. But we'll only ask for one thing. That's a couple acres to bury our dead. Hmm. That's the big difference in America and anybody else. We don't, we're not an imperialistic country. We want to own other people. We want all other people to have the chance to create what we have. It's beautiful. And it's, it is beautiful. And, it's, and I visited every one of those cemeteries. I'm chairman of the Veterans Committee, and I tell you, nothing will, nothing will get to you faster than that. Well, what you just said about uh, people uh, thinking about America, the people, and then the, um, the freedom of opportunity, it's exactly what we heard from every single person yesterday to a person. Uh, particularly the people that don't live here, right. those that are just visiting from other places in the world, um, you could feel that um, they looked at us like you don't ha have any idea how lucky you are to actually be a citizen in America. So um, I think sometimes when, when if you are a citizen and you hear the, the debates that go on here, oftentimes some of us just want to say, hey, it's pretty good. We can make it better, but it's pretty good. We not, need not forget that. I wanted to ask you something. Um, you've had a, not only a tremendous career in real estate, but now in representing us all all the people um, for the last number of years here in Washington. So you've been successful at everything you've done professionally. But you've also had been amazingly successful in family. Uh, married 50 years. That gal actually stayed with you. You sold a couple of houses. Um, yeah. oh, 51 years in June. 51. Last, past June. Yeah, congratulations, by the way, because that's yeah. quite an accomplishment. Uh, it's, she's the one that deserves all the credit. Well, I feel the same way. I made a good choice, and she made it better. I, I agree completely with what you just said. I'm 34 years now with Lisa, and she's the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. Um, I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> She would too, by the way. So we have a consensus now. But I want to ask you, you have had all this success, but everyone that's had success has also faced adversity. Tell us one story of adversity in your life that you've had to overcome. I have Parkinson's. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's uh, seven years ago. I decided after I was diagnosed that I'm going to tell the whole state that I, their senators got Parkinson's and if they don't want to send me back, they don't have to. But I'm going to run again because I think I owe it to the people. And it can help, help in any way I have, like I have in the past. So I, I ran. Nobody had three opponents, but we beat the heck out of everybody. And uh, I had Parkinson's, and it showed. So I said, well, they gave me a chance. I'll try and do real well. And I did real well and have continued to. And I'm going to be up in three more years and running as far as I'm concerned. But uh, that's been a big change. And I spent a little bit of every day trying to do something for the Parkinson's people, people that have Parkinson's. That's my part, and I try and do it. And that's where I try to make a difference. And so. I can just off the cuff, that's the answer I'd give you yeah. if you give me time to think about this. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of people who aren't where they want to be in life in terms of success, whether it's in their personal life or professional life, they oftentimes think that people who have had success have just been lucky. And as you and I both know, it's, it's hard work and it's decisions you make. Like you accepted the fact that you have Parkinson's and now you're working um, to help other people, which... Um, that's the hallmark of what I see when people become their best. They're always focusing on helping people. So listen, if I'm... Now let me ask you a real quick question. Go ahead. Pat, what's the definition of luck? Luck is uh, when preparation meets it's opportunity. opportunity. That's right. Exactly. That's right. why you're so successful. Go ahead. You, <laughs> you can't say never. <laughs> no, so um, I have one question, um, final question for you. So we have a, a, a big audience with us today. And um, if you were to give advice to a single individual out there, life advice, how to become personal, professionally, the best version of themselves, because you've done that, what, what's the advice that you would give all of us? Three or four ways, the things that I subscribe to. One is that you love people and not things. And that means whether it's your teachers or your 
fundraisers or your family or your workers, whatever, you, you love them. You love the university that graduated you and gave you the background education to do things you've done. You love the parents that raised you. You love the friends that you have that made you what you are. You love them, in the, not in the, the uh, love, passion, what you dream about on a Saturday night out in the backyard type stuff. I'm talking about that passion you have for somebody who changed your life. Mm. Your Sunday school teacher, your high school English teacher, whoever it may be, your football coach. For me, it's very simple. Alice Gibson, she's dead now, but Alice Gibson was my senior literature teacher. She made the difference in my life. She taught me how to learn. I was a lucky guy that had enough brain power to get out of school, but not enough brain power to do anything with it. I didn't like to read, and I did everything I wanted to get by. She taught me to turn around and believe in myself. Embarrassed me through the whole senior year, but by the time we graduated, I was given the address at the senior graduation. Wow. And she was the top teacher, and she changed my life. The, the, uh, my whole business career, my father, Influence me. A lot of people think if you work for your father or work for your family father, you, you are because they're trying to take care of you because you can't take, take care of yourself. I wanted to be half as good as my father was. And so his his being good and having a name like Isaacson where everybody, there aren't a lot of Isaacsons running around, so you can't fake who you are. I wanted to be half as good as my father was. And so his his being good and having a name like Isaacson where everybody, there aren't a lot of Isaacsons running around, so. And he was really successful, and I, everybody was going to expect me to be really successful. So I'd use my father as a, not just as, and use him as a father, but I'd use him as a role model. Mm. And I realized all the things I saw him do that were so successful. And I tried to I don't know. be a role model, learn from that. And today I know there are people watching what I do. There are going to be people watching this interview, and they may think this guy's crazy or whatever they think. But you're, when you're on stage, and you're on stage, and these people are on stage, everybody's on stage, you're a role model of somebody. People don't walk up and tell you you're going to be my role model, but they watch you if you're successful. When you reach that point in life where people want, want to be like you, and uh, then it's just not a great accomplishment you can have. And the last thing I'd say is this. You asked me what made America great. The greatest thing about America, other than its people, are the dreams that it represents. Hmm. America's about dreaming. We dreamed to put a man on the moon. We dreamed 100 years ago to fly, and now we're not only flying, we're going to other planets. We dreamed to solve, cure diseases. March of Dimes is basically taking care of a lot of diseases. Measles, is, measles would be totally gone if the African countries would follow the, the vaccination procedures, but we've substantially eradicated measles. We have turned the corner on AIDS. We now, the rate of AIDS growth is, in most all cases is declining. Uh, babies are born every day now with HIV to HIV mothers, but they don't have HIV because the antiretrovirals that we provide as Americans around the world prevent them forever developing that age. When you think about great things like that, now, there's nothing better than doing things like that. So if you eradicate a terrible disease, if you feed a hungry person or teach a hungry person to, to eat how to eat like Jesus did in terms of feeding the masses, there's just no, nothing better. So that's why America is so great. You can dream to be anything and then you can go out and do it. You just have to work hard. I don't want to take all the credit. In fact, don't take credit for it. If you don't, you'll get more credit if you don't take credit than if you do take credit. But just be happy you've got the opportunity to help. And if I can lay down one night and go to sleep, and when I saved a life, changed a life, or made a life, then it doesn't get any better than that. Well, you did. You did, as I said earlier. You did for me. You gave me a role model early in my career, and I appreciate that. Um, and yesterday, we got to spend a lot of time here in Washington just talking to average people off the street. And the things they told us were in large part what you just said, that America is a great place to continue to dream big. And um, whether you're at home with your family, your spouse, your significant other, or whether you're with your employer right now, whether you think about our country, focus on what's best about the people in your house and the people in your company and our country, and then go to work on the rest so we can get even better. Johnny, thanks so much for your time Thank today. You I really appreciate it. it. Thank you very much. I had a riot in Washington. Okay, let me be clear. There was not actually a riot, but I did have the best time personally and professionally. Visiting Washington, D.C. was one of my 2018 PNPB goals in the fun and recreation category. Did not happen in 2018, but it did happen in 2019. I had never visited our nation's capital, so the trip was special for several reasons. First, I checked my PNPB fun and recreation box, and I definitely had some fun in Washington. Second, I also checked my PNPB box for business. We visited our good friend, Doug Duncan, 
affectionately known in his family as D squared or Econo Cowboy. Doug gave all of us an update regarding what's next in the housing industry. Doug gave us an update and we gave Doug a bobblehead. He's now a big deal. If you get a bobblehead, you're a big deal. We also visited with U.S. Senator Johnny Isaacson. As Johnny is an old friend and a former owner of a large real estate company, he checked two boxes, relationships and business. Johnny reminded us that America still, with all of its flaws, offers every one of us the opportunity to be our best. And that is what the personal and professional best program is all about. It's all about becoming the best version of ourselves. It's all about writing our best life story. My big takeaway from my trip is my big giveaway to you today. To a person, everyone we met shared in their own way that America offers the opportunity for all of us to be our best. That was my big takeaway. My two giveaways. First, complacency is the enemy of best. And second, complaining is the arch enemy of best. Complacency is taking for granted people and our position in life. It's a state of accepting our current place. We can, but we shouldn't. We can all become better, and every one of us should take advantage of doing just that, getting better, becoming our best. To do so, we all need to make the choice, and then we need to develop a life plan. You can do that by going to supremebest.com and entering the best GPS portal. Do it today. Develop a life plan that represents your best, and then invite an accountability partner into your life. We can serve as one and look next to you. The person next to you can serve as an accountability partner as well. Share your goals and show up next month and be accountable to the promises that you made. If complacency is the enemy of best, complaining is the arch enemy of best. Complaining is natural. It's a habit. We all do it more or less. The best, they do it less. Most people complain about their spouses, their significant others, their children, their friends, their coworkers, their boss, and lots of folks complain about our country, the best country in the world. Look, we can find all that is wrong with everything and everybody, or we can do what the best do. We can start every day with a heart of gratitude, focusing on what is best about everyone else, and then we can invest in all of them, leaving everyone better than we found them. When we do that, we'll leave our country just a little better than we found it too. And that's what the best do. And that is what we should all do. I hope you enjoyed our program today. I sure did. Smart is next.